Well, as we grow older, we change in appearance and with luck, although it's not a given, we grow wiser. What doesn't change, though, is the spark, the essential thing that distinguishes us from others. It's what we are, it's our DNA, and it's very hard to scrub out. In 1979, a news program was born in Australia. It was lucky to have the very best of fathers. The inaugural executive producer, Gerald Stone, was tasked by Kerry Packer to create a version of an American news magazine, 60 Minutes, for an Australian audience. Back then, we weren't used to seeing Australian reporters out and about in the world, challenging dictators, questioning the high and mighty, negotiating war zones, or even mixing it with the stars. The new program introduced a vivid, personal style of reporting. Gerald Stone turned out to be a brilliant, if sometimes scary, team captain for the reporters he chose to join him on the trek into an Australian television unknown. The first show almost didn't make it to air, thanks to the, shall we say, excitability of the late Kerry Packer. The program Gerald envisaged had a clear direction. Getting ahead around flood control might be hard, but everybody can understand Noah. That was how the American show's founder, Don Hewitt, famously put it. But when Kerry Packer discovered Gerald's premiere wasn't actually going to feature a general report on the British election, something the big man was keen on, he told Gerald encouragingly, well, F you, I'm cancelling the program. The show, however, did go to air after that very early piece of encouragement. And following a largely unwatched start, 60 Minutes found its line and length. It assigned the show's first reporters, George Negus, Ray Martin and Ian Leslie, the job of being the sometimes bolshy conduits between Australians in their living rooms and the world beyond. It was new and it was risky. And speaking of risks, I had the very good luck to be signed up too. Um, I was a rookie reporter and a girl at that. Um, I was nothing but trouble until I think I found my own line and length, and then it was a blast. Since then, the show has evolved. Of course, new captains have led the team and made their own distinctive mark on the show. They've taken on new and talented reporters who've established their place in the viewing life of the country. Incredibly, the program is in its 40th year, and you may have noticed that it's still not shy of controversy. But there is no erasing the DNA of 60 Minutes, its essential character, its way of telling a uniquely compelling story is still on show. Today's team, its producers, its researchers, editors, its camera operators, its soundos, its executive producer Kirsty Thompson and its star reporters belong to a now long tradition. 60 Minutes simply has good genes. As I remember July 1978 that Kerry Packard came to me and he said that you're going to take over this uh, program that we're going to bring in called 60 Minutes. He only gave me uh, a few words of advice. He said, I don't give a f what it takes, but just do it and get it right. Please explain. What can I say? Tough titties. Goodness gracious me. It's being in 60 Minutes. <laughs> I'm Elizabeth Hayes. You realize you're wanted in Australia? <laughs> Six years later. I'm speechless. First of all, I, I knew that I needed three front men. When Gerald Stone rang me about 60 minutes, um, I was ready. Here at the busy coroner's court. The idea of just finding a story anywhere in the world. I used to dream of working on something like that, and I suddenly had the chance. It was like winning the lottery, best call I've ever had in my life. I think George Negus was probably the critical person in the team early on. People stop us in the street almost and tell us that Margaret Thatcher is a plain pig-headed. Why won't you tell me their names and who they are? Attitude. Lots of attitude. And, and I, that's what I wanted. I'm Ian Leslie. I'm George Negus. I'm Ray Martin. Those stories and more tonight on 60 Minutes.
Yes, I did have the first story ever, ever broadcast on 60 Minutes. It was not one of my most memorable stories. We call it butt-legging. Basically, butt-legging is the smuggling of cigarettes across state borders. The reaction after our very first broadcast in February 1979 was a disaster. We thought the play was pretty good. <laughs> the, the, the ratings of the audience said... <laughs> uh, Kerry called me up after the show and said that was terrible. The, the, our enemies were everywhere. They were ready to shoot us down. We were targets for newspaper guys who were earning less money and getting less glory and less glamour than we were getting on 60 Minutes, so we were an easy target. I knew that I had the goods there. I, I had the reporters, I had the team, I had everything going for me, except Kerry Packer. Um, but within three months, we hit our straps and no one could stop us. I think it became a, a rating success because it was different. And there was almost a no dickhead policy from Gerald Stone. You could trust the people you were with. And, and I think the cameramen and the sound men and the producers were the best in the business, not just here, but around the world. I thought it was um, time to add another reporter. I thought it would be good to add a, a woman reporter. That was interesting. I had no idea who this person was. Uh, I wouldn't call it jealousy, but... We believe we had the... You know, we'd paid our dues, Ian and George and I. And we were a bit puffed up. And, uh, and we had our doubts. <laughs> uh, I got a call from Yana saying, one night, saying, Leslie, if we should have dinner. I said, no, I'm too busy. We were quite arrogant about Yana joining. What makes Haiti different is voodoo. But um, as these things do, the problem worked itself out. a fantastic reporter and she's a beautiful person to be with and the family grew a little bit bigger. She had all the makings of a 60 Minutes person and so I think it was in that fourth year was it that uh, that Jana came to be. That is? Is, is that the way it is? <laughs> well, yes, bossy boots. <laughs> Of course, what Ray, Ian, George and Diana started went on to become one of the most popular and successful television programs in Australia. You'd be amazed to know how tiny they really are. May I ask? <laughs> and up yours, Lester. <laughs> George, are you gay? Am I gay? It's a pretty, pretty direct first question. Um... It smells strongly of caribou. We all tell stories in our own way, but we have guiding principles. For an English backpacking couple, this was the highway of adventure. And that's to tell great stories through great people. We all have that inner strength inside of us, but we just never get tested. It's going to take five minutes. I'm sorry. Right. But also that ethos of show me, don't tell me. So we try to take the audience as close to the action that's as possible. Oh, God. Sometimes too close. <laughs> Whoa, Jesus! I grew up in kind of ABC, BBC style, where you were an observer, an impartial observer. You did not get in the way of the story. You didn't stand in the way of the scenery. You didn't stand between the story and the camera. In 60 minutes, you were required to do that. Uh, the trick is to do it without looking, looking like some kind of grandstanding bastard. I think I got away with it. I don't know. I didn't know that anybody ever told me I had to go to a war zone. I was hired on false, <laughs> on a false premise. Um, but again, the, the reason you're going there is not because you're an adrenaline junkie, um, not because you worship war, but because that's the story. That's the conflict. Not to go there would be not to tell the story uh, as completely as we can. And we've been told to go and take cover. It certainly sounds like it's a lot closer than that. The Gun in My Head story has probably been replayed on 60 Minutes more than any other scene. How would you execute that man? And the fellow brings out a big gun. We scared the man like this. We go, whoop. It was a moment of white light that went through your head. I just said, why did you do that? He said, you asked me the question. I thought you wanted to know the answer. Just cut there, mate. I should have kept the cameras running. I turned to the camera, I said, cut, mate. Uh, I, w I just couldn't think of another question. You know that I was receiving your shells last night. Richard Carlton, of course, was a man who loved danger. See, he intrigued people by his arrogance and willingness to do things that other people didn't do. 
Last night, it was 21st century warfare. Richard's best question ever. He's talking to the completely mad Shirley MacLaine. And then you felt that you were able to talk to the elephant because you'd met the elephant in a previous life. You find that difficult to understand? I find it impossible. He said, perhaps, Ms. McLean, I, I should ask you, is there anything that you don't believe in? What a great question. If that was Richard's best question, his uh, close second would most likely be his very last question. He was at Beaconsfield covering the trapped miners and he asked one very significant question. And in doing that, he gave all the other journalists there really a masterclass. Why is it that you continue to send men into work in such a dangerous environment? And he turned around and he just looked at the camera for a moment. And bang, he's gone. Professionally, Richard set the benchmark in storytelling and in, in some of his interviews. He, he did extraordinary interviews. Ah, oh, love him, miss him every day. And so does the show. What most people want to know is, when did the sex begin? Do you think Kelly murdered her baby? Belle, 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 please. Do you accept the Lee? level of damage you've done to people's trust? There is no doubt that the 60 minute years were the most fulfilling, the most enjoyable, and the most wonderful years of my working life. Television programs over the years that fail because audiences are treated like they're dopes. Um, and, and they're fed porridge and audiences spit it out. They don't, you know, programs that uh, don't work usually don't deserve to work. 60 Minutes has worked for 40 years because it's a really good program. 60 Minutes is one of those once in a lifetime opportunities and I can't believe uh, the success that I've uh, enjoyed. Uh, and people still come up to me uh, on the street sometimes and say, didn't you used to be Gerald Stone? <laughs> I say, yes, I used to be. Welcome to the TV Week Logies Hall of Fame, 60 Minutes. don't cry, <laughs> so I guess I lost my <laughs> chance to be a good reporter. For, uh, Gerald Stone obviously is our guiding light, and um, because of you, uh, we are still here today. Um, 40 minutes is a long time in television, so 40 years is an extremely long time in television. Um, those who came before us are our inspiration. John, Paul, George, Ringo and Yana, I call them, the Beatles of television. <laughs> the 60 Minutes is more, way more than the faces out front. There's a wealth of talent behind the scenes. We've had 40 years of professional camera crews, producers, editors, and so many more who keep the program going. Gerald Stone, though, is the real star. You've been the guiding light, as I said before, from the very beginning. You've been with us through the good times and through the bad, and we thank you enormously for that. Thank you, sir. And we'd like... Gerald Stone is a, is a star, and he's a special man to us. Um, also special to us are our viewers. We thank those viewers who for 40 years have tuned into our stories. Um, and in many res respects, 60 Minutes is something that belongs, is a program that belongs to you, the viewers. Our mission has always been to tell great stories and that continues to be our story. And uh, we thank you very much and a special thank you 
to you, Thanks. Gerald Stone. Thank you, Liz. Thank you have been a magnificent guide to us during this program, and it has been there have been good times and there have been bad, but you have been with us. We thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>